We hear a lot about new physics, but what could it do for us? Today I want to have a look at what use it might be to find dark matter, quantum gravity or a theory of everything. I can't believe we haven't talked about this before. What is it good for is such an obvious question. Why did we stop asking it? We can take a clue from a famous Feynman quote. Physics is like sex. Sure, it may give some practical results, but that's not why we do it. That was then. Today, birth rates are so low that governments all over the world would like to ask you to not forget about the practical results. And maybe it's about time that physicists too ask about practical results again. But does new physics even have practical results? New physics has become the standard phrase that the media uses for some fundamentally new discovery, a law of nature that we didn't know of previously. I guess that's somewhat insulting for many research areas in physics. Actually, I don't have to guess, I know, because people from these areas complain to me about this all the time. If you look at the recent Nobel Prizes in physics, and leave aside those that weren't actually for physics, then they were awarded, for example, for topological insulators or femtosecond measurements. And these were new, and physics. So, new physics, right? Yes, but... These discoveries all fit with the theories that we already knew. The way that the term new physics has become used, it means something that doesn't fit with the already known theories. Examples of this would be finding out what makes up dark matter or dark energy, a theory of everything, quantum gravity, or demonstrating that quantum mechanics isn't correct. What could this be good for? That's what I want to talk about today. A new discovery might lead to both a gain of knowledge as well as practical applications. Of course, we can't know what the new discovery will lead to before having made it, but we know something about the problems that we're trying to solve in the foundations of physics, and that tells us where the solution would fit in and also what it could be good for. Let's start with dark matter. Suppose we finally find the particle that makes up dark matter, what could we learn from it? It'd almost certainly help us understand how galaxies form and change over time. This is because the details of galaxy formation and also mergers depend on the properties of the particle, like its mass and interaction rate. For the same reason, it'd also help us understand the large-scale structure of galactic filaments and possibly how matter itself came into existence in the early universe. Other than that, I'm afraid it wouldn't do much for us. This is because if dark matter is a particle, we already know that it just goes through normal matter. So we can't catch it or do anything with it. Instead of dark matter, it could also be that gravity is modified. Again, this would tell us a lot about how the universe came to be the way it is. But again, in practical terms, we can't do much with this knowledge. The reason similar to that for dark matter. We already know that if gravity is modified, it must be a very small modification in our vicinity. Otherwise, we'd already have noticed. Though I think that if we ever are to become a space-traveling species, we should know how dark matter affects people traveling through it or how to properly account for modified gravity. It'd be unfortunate if you used the wrong equation and ended up in the wrong galaxy. Let's move on to unification. A grand unified theory is the name for a common origin of the three interactions in the standard model of particle physics. That's electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear force. Grand unified theories come with additional particles that we haven't yet measured. They have heavy gauge bosons or more complicated Higgses or additional fermions and so on. Some of those could make up dark matter. Could the other particles have practical use? No, because we already know that if any such particles exist, it either takes a lot of energy to create them, or it's very unlikely that we create them. That's because otherwise they already have shown up in particle colliders. Either way, they're completely impractical to use for anything. A grand unified theory might allow us to calculate the properties of particles in the standard model in principle. 
In practice, we already know these properties, so there isn't much to gain from that. And also, grand unified theories usually work with a large symmetry group that needs to be broken. This symmetry breaking brings in a lot of new parameters, which makes these theories far from simple in computational terms. In contrast to what physicists often say, these grand unified theories are in practice more complicated than the standard model. Let's then look at quantum gravity. That's a theory which combines gravity with quantum physics. The current theory for gravity that we use is general relativity, and it describes gravity as the curvature of space-time. A theory of quantum gravity, therefore, would also tell us the quantum properties of space and time. But space and time give rise to causality and the speed of light limit. And so quantum gravity might tell us how to bend or break these rules. We expect quantum gravity to tell us what happens inside of black holes and at the Big Bang. And though, of course, we can't know whether that'll pan out, it's a reasonable expectation. That said, quantum gravity suffers from a similar problem as the previous ones, which is that we know its effects are weak and hard to come by because otherwise we'd already have measured them. This makes it unlikely it'd have much practical use. But from a theoretical perspective, figuring out quantum gravity would almost certainly be more fruitful than grand unification or dark matter. This is because the former two can quite easily be accommodated within the mathematical frameworks that we're currently using, quantum field theories. But for quantum gravity, that doesn't seem to work. It looks like we need something entirely new, like maybe Stephen Wolfram's hypergraphs that we talked about recently, or Jonathan Oppenheim's post-quantum gravity. This is why, I believe, physicists tend to be more excited about quantum gravity than grand unification. That brings us to the question of what's with quantum physics itself? In quantum physics, we have this problem that we don't really understand what happens in a measurement. The standard way to treat a measurement is to say, well, this is when quantum effects disappear. And we know they do. But just how? Loosely speaking, we know that objects with quantum properties tend to be small, while those without tend to be large, but we don't understand the details. It doesn't seem to be just a property of the size or the total mass or the number of particles. Whether a measurement happens depends on what the particles do, how they amplify a property, the property that we want to measure. If we figured this out, we'd understand much better how how and when quantum effects persist. Also remember that quantum physics has this weird non-local behavior that seems to be faster than the speed of light. I'm not saying it is, but maybe it is. What I mean is understanding the measurement in quantum physics is another way to learn more about locality and the speed of light limit. Among the new physics, this one would be the closest to applications. I think it's not a stretch to think that if we knew what a detector is, that might help with building better detectors. But there's a more general reason for why this problem is closest to application. It's because the process of a measurement, the vanishing of quantum effects, is in a range that we can experimentally access. In contrast to heavy new particles or feeble consequences of quantum gravity, it happens in front of our eyes all the time. So I think it's plausible that this had become useful for some applications. Remember, for example, that nuclear fusion is ultimately a tunneling process. It's a quantum phenomenon. If we understood better how quantum physics works, maybe there are ways to affect this process that we haven't yet thought of. I'm not saying that this will be the case. I'm just saying that that's a possibility. What about dark energy, that mysterious stuff that makes the universe expand faster? It sounds so promising. Can't we extract this energy and fuel a car with it? The issue with dark energy is that if it exists, it's extremely thinly distributed. Even if we knew how to harness it, it wouldn't be good for much. Finally, and this point shouldn't be underestimated, solving either one of these problems could help us solve the other one. Figuring out what dark matter is made of could help us with grand unification or the other way around. Modified gravity could help with quantum gravity and quantum gravity in return 
turn could help with unification. But in the end, maybe the question we should ask is not what new physics can do for us, but what we can do for new physics. If this video inspired you to do something for physics, I recommend that you have a look at Brilliant.org because it's a great starting point to learn both general problem solving and specific scientific knowledge. Brilliant offers courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. Whether you want to know more about large language models or algebra, want to learn coding in Python or know how computer memory works, Brilliant has you covered. It's a fast and easy way to learn and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. And they're adding new courses each month. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. Sounds good. I hope it does. You can try Brilliant yourself for free if you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabine or scan the QR code. That way you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days and you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and give it a try. I'm sure you won't regret it. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.